<laughs> Welcome back to class, everyone. In this unit, we will be learning about personality. Thank you. All right, so last class, we were talking about personality type theories. But there's some theories that say there's 12 different kinds of people. Virgos are like this, Scorpios are like that. And there's that MBTI, it says, you know, you're an ENTJ, you're an INTP, and there's a team of those. What all type theories do is use a categorical lens. It's kind of like a binary. You are this thing or you are not this thing, okay? You are an extrovert or you are not an extrovert, right? You're an extrovert or, or an introvert. You are a man or you are a woman. And that's one way to think about things. It's kind of easy, but it's also simplistic and we lose a lot of complexity. It's kind of a black or white thing where there's no in between. Personality trait theories use a quantitative lens. And so they will, They'll start by specifying a number of, of categories. So extroversion is a category, but then we're not going to ask the question, are you an extrovert or not anymore? We're going to be look, we'll look at it as a variable where there's levels of that variable. So you can be very, very low on extroversion and, and the word for that is extroversion. Okay, we might have different words for one end of the scale, but it's a scale, okay? Or you could be in the middle, or you could be on the really high end. And see, the thing about many, if not most, of the variables that we study in psychology is that they're normally distributed. Not always, okay, but, but very often. And what that means, what does that mean for this, this binary way of thinking? You're an introvert, you're an, you're an extrovert, you're, you're masculine or, or you're feminine. When a variable is normally distributed, which is typical in psychology, it means that most people fall in the middle. And so extroversion actually is a normally distributed variable. And you'll hear me talking like you're an extrovert or an introvert, but that really describes people who are far out on the tails. And so the tails there are showing people who are more than two standard deviations away from the mean, either on the very high end or the very low end. Well, 95% of people fall within two standard deviations. 95% are in that middle. And I'm talking about 5% out in the tails, two and a half on this side, two and a half percent on the other side. So that's, that's missing a lot of people, isn't it? So when you hear me talking in that, that categorical way, are you an extrovert or an introvert? Or are you neurotic? Are you emotionally stable? Are you agreeable versus disagreeable? Well, a lot of that won't really resonate with you because if you're a randomly selected student, you probably fall in the middle. But you might know somebody that is described by, by being out on that tail, okay? And so same with masculinity and femininity. What if a lot of people are androgynous? Maybe we make we don't make room for that when we um, talk about variables when we frame them categorically. So in psychology, we want to describe people, uh, describe their personality, how they behave, how they think, how they feel, and well, we do that with adjectives. Right? There there are words that describe people. So. Think of adjectives that describe people's psychology, like not their appearance, not words like short and tall, okay? But words like grumpy, friendly, worried, interested, bored, organized, messy, sad, happy. You get the idea. So it was a psychologist named Gordon Alford, and he found that there were went through a count of them in an English dictionary, maybe the Oxford English dictionary, and he found that there were 18,000 words like that. And those words, those adjectives describe traits. 
see there's a, a grumpy person has high on trait grumpiness. Okay, they're, they're, they're traits. So from a trait-based lens, everyone has a score on that trait, whether it's zero or in the middle or, or at the top of the scale you have to invent to measure that trait. Anxiousness is, is a trait. Okay, that trait might strongly describe you. Okay, you could be high on trait anxiety, be described as an anxious person, or it might not. You might be low on trait anxiety and instead be described as a very cool, calm, and collected person. So there's, there's 18,000 of those words. I mean, there's probably more words now, but that's a lot of words. There, there aren't really, there aren't 18,000 distinct non-overlapping traits. In fact, there's a lot of overlap between some of those words, like grumpy and cantankerous and nasty. Okay, so some traits cluster. So you might find that somebody who's who's friendly is also outgoing. Though friendly and outgoing aren't the same thing. They might correlate, okay? Maybe they're also chatty, talkative, gregarious, bold, confident. A friendly person doesn't have to be a confident person, but they seem to go along, okay? Not a hard and fast rule, but there's, there's a positive association between some traits. And that clustering can be measured statistically. And then we call that a factor. So the factor that I was just describing with words like outgoing, chatty, bold, confident is the factor of extroversion. And that factor has two poles, kind of a low end and a high. You're hearing about the high end. But let's say I look at the low end and I would be using words like um, quiet, shy, inhibited, retiring, demure. Okay? And all those adjectives also belong to the factor of extroversion. They're on the low end. Okay, so we can take 18,000 words and maybe we can get them down to only like five or six factors. So if you take a personality trait test, they'll end up with, with like a, a profile. So this is a um, highly stylized image from your textbook. And it's showing that the person that took this test scored high on extroversion. This is a norm-based test where uh, the 50th percentile would be in the middle. And this kind of looks like the 75th percentile, which would mean that this person is more extroverted than 75% of people who took the test. Your next question is, who was this test normed on? And the answer is a bunch of psychology undergraduates. But we tend to think of it as compared to everyone globally in the whole wide world. Okay, so that's how you interpret a norm-based test. So this person is average on openness in the context of a sample of the test that's normed on. And they are very emotionally stable in that context and very agreeable in that context. So it's, it's a relative measure, right? It's not saying, you know, are you agreeable enough to be uh, a good secretary for a boss who wants to agree? It ought to be like a criterion according to that boss. Okay. I'm a lady. Hello, welcome. That's called to be great by a new alumna. Okay, well, welcome. So, um, the I think identified the first two dimensions, the first two factors of personality, which were extroversion and neuroticism. Neuroticism can also be called emotionality or emotional stability. They seem to have a, a strong sort of biological basis. So you'll notice that there's, there's four quadrants here. This is because they're doing a two by two thing, okay? So neuroticism, which has these constructs that have survived into later models. So we don't use a two-factor model anymore. We're now on a six-factor model, but the five-factor model and the six-factor model have these dimensions in them. So neuroticism, emotionality, emotional stability is about having unstable versus stable mood. Kind of about how reactive your nervous system is to stress. 
It's some people are jumpy, okay? There's the cranky baby and the chill baby, and it's a matter of temperament. But, you know, you could learn stress management strategies over your life, of course. But some people are just more reactive to stress. So a person who is high in neuroticism is hit harder per unit of a stressful stimulus. See, different people going undergoing the same stressor, and some people react to it, some people are like traumatized by it, and some people are, are not. And there are individual differences in emotional stability. Okay, so people who are higher in neuroticism are more reactive, and it takes less to destabilize them. Introversion versus extroversion are arguably about how much stimulation you need from your environment, your sensitivity to be overwhelmed by that stimuli. So brain activity scans of extroverts indicate that they sort of have below normal uh, kind of brain arousal, like it's relatively low. And so you might want to go out there and get some stimulation, right? So if you're, if you run, at baseline, a little cognitively understimulated, you might like to go out and talk to people and do your work in a busy cafe. Okay. Um, I'm a strong extrovert and I'm very happy working from the cafeteria. Goodbye, say hi. Yeah, I prefer my day that way. If I'm like, when I was alone in this lab with the windows, I don't like that so much. But some people would love that. Okay. So if you're a strong extrovert, and you're sort of staying at home, you might feel a little down. You might even be motivated to do things that would be too much for other people, like going skydiving or bungee jumping, or just staying up all night, partying, and just tire other people out. Um, extroverts have more uh, dopamine and dopamine-related neural activity. So there's a, a neurotransmitter system um, dopamine is a neurotransmitter that's associated with, with pleasure, with uh, striving, being focused, finding interest, things interesting, and being kind of into it. So, arguably, introverts are more cognitively aroused at baseline. And so, they don't need that much extra stimulation. Thank you, that's enough. Maybe less is better. Okay, to be more sensitive to the incoming stimuli. They, they don't need any more of that. And there's, there's evidence that the lemon tastes more sour to introverts because the psychologist measured the amount of saliva they produced. They produced more saliva to do something sour than, than the extroverts. The extroverts like hot sauce. No, that's that. Uh, introverts is often misunderstood as like shyness or social anxiety or not liking other people, but maybe introverted people just seek lower level of, of stimulation from their environment, including their social environment, right? So, and, and that's not so much about how you react to it, but how you're receiving it and how that's maybe tiring you out or boosting. So a good introversion, extroversion question is like, are you energized? by being around other people and their rights. Is that how you charge your battery? Right? Do you feel kind of sad when you're alone quickly? Or are you energized, you recharge in those quieter settings? Maybe quickly worn out by, by other people. So there are more dimensions, more factors of personality have, have been found. The most widely used personality trait measure in psychology is the five factor model. This is from the 1980s. And so it's in the greatest currency, although there is an important update that I will talk to you about today. So it's known as the big five and it's the one that's in your textbook. So an acronym to remember it is, is ocean or canoe words too. So each of the five factors has sub factors. And I'm just gonna let's like maybe look at, at one or two of them. I'll stick with the example of extroverting. 
So under the factor of extroversion, there are subfactors or, or facets. So one of them is, is activity. Some people are more active than others. One of them is assertiveness. Sensation seeking, going skydiving and bungee jumping. Gregariousness, friendliness, sociability. So being sociable is something that correlates with sensation. Having positive emotion, kind of like our dopamine makes you feel. Sort of dopaminergic state. So these cluster together, even though it's very different things, they tend to cluster together. That doesn't mean they have to cluster together in you. You could take this test and I'll give you your, um, you know, you might have an average level of extroversion, but it could, you could be way up there on gregariousness and really low on sensation seeking for whatever reasons that make you the unique individual that you are. And your overall score will actually be a combination of these subtests. So if you're really high, super high on extroversion, it would mean that you're high on all these, these subfacets. Interesting to see how we can look at anxiety, sadness in, in different ways, different lenses. You might be very used to looking at sadness or anxiety through a, through a mental illness lens, as a depression or an anxiety disorder. There are many different lenses in psychology. You can look at it through the lens of personality. So you find anxiety and depression, self-consciousness, vulnerability as a facet of personality. Okay. There are a lot of value judgments in personality. Okay, so this is from, from your textbook. And I want you to see how psychologists construe some personality traits as better than others. There's an assumption here that there's like one good personality that you should have. And it's high extroversion, high openness, high conscientiousness, high agreeableness, low neurosis. Look at the words they used to describe. So get extroversion. So hot, outgoing, fun, and loving, energetic. Yay! Solitary, sober, reserved. That's that's not as judgy as the other value judgments, but it feels kind of like an extrovert is a better person. Looking at that, but openness, curious, imaginative, independent, and then on the other side, closed-minded, practical, and conforming. Their conscientiousness. Efficient, organized, and careful versus impulsive, disorganized, and careless. I could call that flexible and spontaneous. And that would be less stigmatizing and apologizing. But we're making a choice for some reason to use stigmatizing language for some goals and not, not the others. So there's several reasons why we're, why we're privileging a certain end of that distribution. And you can wonder why. Agreeableness, very interesting. Agreeable person is friendly, trusting, compassionate. I should put friendly under extroversion. I'm not doing that. But disagreeableness, oh my, antagonistic, suspicious, and uncooperative. There are people who stand their ground, stand up to things, argue. Is that bad? Maybe sometimes that's good. Neuroticism, neurotic, anxious, insecure. The word neurotic is itself kind of stigmatizing. That's what Freud called his patients. Okay. Versus being calm, confident, and insecure. Uh, and here's another one from your textbook. They're doing it again. And we've looked at, at some of these, but under a lower grade, it's ruthless, suspicious, and uncooperative. If there's some kind of scheme, some kind of shenanigan, disagreeable people will be onto that. Sometimes that's a good thing, right? Being at 100% trustingness can, can get you burned. But we're suggesting that we kind of like the, the, the agreeable people more. Um, so it suggests you can be soft-hearted, 
trusting and helpful. And those are great things to be. But every strength is also a weakness because what if somebody's exploiting you or taking advantage of you? Do you be soft-hearted and lenient about that and keep letting them take advantage of you? Agreeable people are more easily exploited. Um, neuroticism, anxious, insecure, and self pity It has like a bite to it. So I think that this is very unhealthy. Actually, I think it's toxic. And I think that a lot of ideas and worldviews that psychologists present with objective science I kind of get into cultural myths and are pretty toxic. So, so who does this myth of, of the good personality go with? You? The person with power in a system? I mean, if, if all my students would be were agreeable, I could do whatever I wanted, right? And if I wanted to talk to you, then you'd be happy and bubbly and excited and talk to me. That might work for me. Um, I find the, the openness one, one interesting, like what, what kind of people are practical versus all taken up with art appreciation and philosophy? If you take the big five personality test, it'll ask you about how much you like going to the opera or an art gallery. Who has time to go to the art gallery and the ballet? Right, who in society is more concerned with practical things? Practical problems, shoveling the snow. So upper class people have a lot of time for philosophy and to go to the art gallery and the ballet, the ballet and, and the opera. So if those people who seem practical and down to earth also seem conforming, well, is that because of their personality? Or could it be because we rigidly structure their work routines and police them with rewards and punishments when they step out of line. Okay. So I can look at this and wonder that is the personality trait factor of openness as an individual level measure, does that reflect class privilege? Right. So people who are high in openness are also supposedly independent and they love variety and they they get into these passions like, like art, music, and, and, and philosophy. Interestingly, academic passion. That sounds a lot like being rich. Uh, it, it takes all kinds to make a world, and human communities encounter all kinds of different problems that they have to solve. There's all kinds of different environments that we have to adapt to, and, and that's why we need diversity. And that's why we need people with different skill sets and preferences and attitudes, because they might look at or solve problems in different ways. Okay, there's no one best way to be or act in the world. Okay, so we're social animals. And we actually do things as teams and families and communities. And as a discipline, psychology has a weakness of making it all about the person, putting it all on the individual, because it is kind of the science of, of the individual person. We forget that we're social animals that live in communities. And, you know, sociology is very good at that kind of stuff, very, very woke to power relationships that psychologists are often blind to, even when they participate in it as the more powerful, privileged psychologists. But you now maybe sociology has a blind eye to, to individual variability. So take both and trust that. So there's this dark lens that's applied to some of the, the poles of those personality traits. But um, I could flip the lens, right? instead of pathologizing something, what if, what if I looked at it as a strength? So low conscientiousness, disorganized, careless, and impulsive. Well, I could call that flexible and spontaneous, fluid. Okay? Maybe you need that person on the team or in the village to, to say something and challenge it when, when we're being too rigid. And that might not be the best way to do things. Disagreeableness looks pretty, pretty bad, Ooh, suspicious and uncooperative. Well, good teams need somebody who is a skeptic, 
if you're on a team and nobody takes the skeptic role, I teach organizational psychology and sometimes we have to, uh, sorry, organizational development, we have to assign the role of skeptic to people on teams which are scared to take it. But if nobody does that job, you get something called groupthink. Everyone is in such harmony and they're all like, yay, it's such a great idea. But they end up doing something foolish. And a lot of really big disasters, most challenger disaster, go back to that kind of groupthink situation where nobody was criticizing, questioning, challenging. You need that person on your team. Maybe you don't, you know, if it's a, a rare trait, maybe that's all the better. Maybe if everyone on a team was like that, that'd be a problem. But it's just as much of a problem to have everyone on the team be super agreeable. Anxious people, right? They see trouble coming from a, a mile away and they can help the group prepare for it. So the, the issue that I see here is, is a lack of awareness of social context, human social context and the way that individuals have a place in a community, like, like a node in a web or a piece of a, a jigsaw puzzle. And all these profiles represent different strengths, your strengths that you can contribute, they're different talents in a way. And they all have their weaknesses, right? And a, a service that community provides, like one of the reasons we need community is that other people can cover for our weaknesses while we play to our strengths. Other people can act as a check on our own blind spots and our capacity for self-deception. But what this is suggesting to you is that there's one good personality that everyone should have. I don't buy that. So there's been an update, a big important update to the five-factor model. It's a six-factor model of personality called the, um, the Hexaco. It is less research and less used. When you go and take a personality class here, it'll all be big five. I imagine you probably won't even hear about that. So, however, research shows that it has incremental validity over the big five. I mean, if we're trying to predict something in a head-to-head -head test, it predicts it better. So use this model, not that one. And what it does is that it adds a six factor called honesty humility the low end of that pole is some of those darker sides of human nature like machiavellianism or narcissism okay and it um it also pulls anger out of emotional uh stability because on the five factor model it's one of the moods but anger is different Anger is the key emotion for dominance. And it puts anger in under disagreeableness. And another way you could look at agreeableness, disagreeableness, is sort of submissiveness, going along to get along, pleasing others, versus being kind of more independent or even dominant. So you cannot read this slide, do not try. Um, but this is that the six factors are honesty, humility, emotionality, that used to be called neuroticism, extroversion, agreeableness, conscientiousness, and openness to experience. This is the test that I sent you guys. This is the one that you have your scores for. I'm going to go through these and talk about how to interpret it. But the first thing I want to say is that, like the big five, it is heavy on value judgment. Okay. But we don't need to use that lens. And I think you probably shouldn't. I care about your well being. So I'm going to go through these. So, first one is honesty, humility. And it has four sub factors. Okay. One of them is sincerity, and it's your tendency to be sort of genuine in interpersonal relationships. People who have a low score on that will tend to like flatter other people or pretend to like them in order to obtain favors. Okay. People, so whereas high scorers are unwilling 
to manipulate others. If you have low power and you are on the wrong end of the system, there are ways to survive the system that can be like saying the right thing to the right person. So I have a lot of privilege. And one of the reasons um, I get to be bluntly honest with people is because I do not care if I lose my job. I can afford to not care. Okay. So this kind of brings you into thinking that like, well, you know, honest people are better and these other people are manipulative. But when I was talking to this book, to one of the custodians here, she sort of explained to me that she kind of had to do that to get by, right? That she had to sort of flatter people's egos to, to get through and to get, get by. So please remember there's always that, that social context. Um, fairness. Tendency to avoid fraud and corruption. So low scores are willing to gain by cheating or stealing. High scores are unwilling to take advantage of other individuals or society at large. It's easier to be fair when you trust the system and you believe that it works fairly. What if you're on the wrong end of a system? It's not fair to you. Might you end up stealing? Maybe, I don't know. Greed avoidance is the, the greed scale. Some people want money. Some people are more motivated and interested in money than others. Some people want status. Some people will spend a lot of money on, on a handbag that has the logo that suggests that you can you know, afford an expensive handbag and they want to be seen with that. They want to be in the uh, luxury environments and send their kids to the highest status school and get into the best golf course, that kind of thing. And the modesty scale assesses the tendency to see yourself as equal to others or say superior or, yeah, superior. So people who see themselves, uh, so low scores see themselves as superior and entitled to privileges that others don't have when people act like they're above the rules. And then high scores would see themselves as kind of ordinary people without any entitlement to special privileges. Having power makes people's psychology move in the direction of lower honesty humility. So in the workplace, sometimes you'll notice that the management acts as like above the rules and they can do what they want and they might lie to you, that kind of thing. So having more power does bring out that kind of thing. Also makes people more self-absorbed and more self-focused. The people who think that they're better than other people, like they're superior humans, that they're entitled to more, are called narcissists. The narcissistic traits. Um, when a group of people does that as a matter of culture and tradition, you might identify them as the upper class. The ancient Greeks had a myth about a young man named Narcissus, and he was very good looking, but not very nice. And so the vengeful Aphrodite punishes him. Maybe he pissed her off somehow. Anyway, so she, she draws him to a pool in the woods. And when he drinks water from the pool, he's captured by his own reflection. And he falls in love. He can't stop looking at himself. And he stops eating and drinking. And he died. And the place of his body, a beautiful gold and white flower sprang up. And so that character is the origin of the term narcissism. And so it's a personality disorder, like really, really pathologically low honesty, humility. Narcissism is marked by grandiosity, excessive need for admiration. Not just attention, excessive need for attention is histrionic personality disorder. It's like off the chart extroversion. I'm the center of the show. It's like admiration, right? He wants to be on the pedestal and have other people. Kind of um, worshiping it. There's an inability to empathize. So it's kind of, it's all about, it's all about that. Uh, 
people who are being narcissistic can be um, tricky to work with. Um, they are very vulnerable to criticism. They, they do not receive that with humility. And okay? you can get really angry, really defensive. Maybe they're associating their performances and what you think of them with your self-worth, and that's fragile, and they need to defend it. Okay. But the problem is if a narcissist, somebody who's in the narcissistic headspace is angry with them, with you because you have maybe threatened their ego, it's very, very upsetting for them. It's called narcissistic injury, like psychologically devastating. Um, they might take it on themselves to punish you. And since they're above the rules and you cross them, then they might break the rules of normal human engagement. And so you can get like emotional abuse and, and gaslighting, sort of manipulation, deception, things that are really unfair as a conflict resolution strategy. So some of that kind of like backstabbing, lying, rumor spreading kind of stuff that you weren't, you didn't see coming. All right, on to emotionality, which is the Hexaco version of neuroticism. It has four sub factors. So fearfulness is your tendency to experience anxiety. And high scorers really want to avoid harm. There's a lot to be said for avoiding harm. Um, anxiety, the anxiety scale is about worrying. Okay, like are you thinking about what might happen and, and being kind of preoccupied by that? It's not the same thing as being fearful. Dependence is about your need for emotional support from others. Okay, you might, if you're a high score, you might want to share your difficulties with other people who could provide encouragement, support. And the sentimentality scale is about kind of about empathy. This is different from the big five. So notice that empathy sort of falls under emotionality, not agreeable. So if an agreeable person seems nice, they might try to please you, right? They might not really empathize with you. That's different. Okay, so, and you can be disagreeable and care, and you can be agreeable and not care. Okay, so empathy is under emotionality. There is a gender difference in, in this trait. Right, it's a pretty strong one. It's also a gender difference in, in mood disorders. Uh, so women are more likely to have anxiety and depression. And that changes over the life course. And that is most, that difference is the strongest during women's sort of natural childbearing years. And that levels off after menopause. And there's an argument in evolutionary psychology. And please remember that evolutionary psychology is very speculative. Um, that a younger woman's emotions don't have to be adapted to her as an individual, but they might be more adapted to the, the mother-child dyad, right? And historically, kind of women have done the child raising. And um, do toddlers get themselves irrationally in trouble? Right? Well, well, yeah, they, they do all kinds of irrational things. They run out in the middle of the road, they stick things up their nose, right? They climb on, they pull things in the kitchen. They can just like pull something down on them that, that would like burn them. Okay, so there are some individuals in our society, like very young people, very old people, very sick people who actually are at much higher levels of risk. And so, you know, maybe, Maybe having, if somebody is taking care of them, having a mind that's like, these are the, the hundred thousand different things this kid might do is actually adaptive. That's an idea from evolutionary psychology. So, okay, on to extroversion. So that has four sub factors. So one of them is about your sort of confidence in, in a social context. 
right? You're not sort of worried that if you go to a party, people won't really like you kind of thing. Okay. Social boldness is about um, kind of like your confidence, raising your hand in class and saying something. Especially when I'm recording, that takes boldness. Most students don't do that. In class of 100, I usually have about five students who will do that. A lot of people have a fear of public speaking. Um, so stability is like gregariousness, tendency to enjoy conversation, interaction, go to parties. And then liveliness is that, that energy and enthusiasm. And so um, Kai Spore sent it to be optimistic and high spirits. Sounds a bit dopaminergic. Agreeableness has four subfacets. And this is very tilted towards being agreeable is better. I think being agreeable is good. I think being in the middle is good. And I think being disagreeable is good. Okay, those are just ways of being. And they're like skill sets and orientations that could be adaptive or maladaptive depending on the context. So first is forgivingness. It assesses your willingness to feel trust and liking towards people who have caused you harm in the past. So low scorers are kind of like, they will not forget that you did that. We call that holding a grudge. Maybe they feel like, you know, we need to confront this, challenge this, work it out, but not kind of sweep it under the rug with the other way. Um, so high scores are usually ready to trust others again and to reestablish friendly relations after having been treated badly. I'm so grateful for my agreeable friend. I screw up, it just keeps being my friend. Yay. Agreeable people are easier to exploit because of this. The gentleness scale is about your tendency to be mild and lenient in dealings with other people. So low scores tend to be really critical, like they can be partially critical and judgmental. They don't let you off the hook. But somebody who is high in gentleness will, they're, they're more lenient. They're like, oh, okay, well, you we were having a bad day and we all lie sometimes. It wasn't really that bad. Flexibility is your willingness to compromise and cooperate with others. So people who are really disagreeable, know what they want, go for what they want, assert what they want. But people who are high enough flexibility, subfacet of agreeableness, are more willing to compromise and, and cooperate. They uh, agreeable people are all are more conflict avoidant. They like to harmonize, the peacemaker. Disagreeable people much more comfortable with conflict and confrontation. And, you know, there are different environments, and I would say and different things you can do with your life. Um, if you want to be a leader, I don't like the word leader, uh, but you can't be conflict avoidant because people will come to you and ask for things that you need to say no to. And you have to say no. And so conflict avoidant leaders can find themselves in a pickle when they can't say no to somebody, they can't stand up to somebody, and they end up letting somebody do something they shouldn't be doing or even get involved with it. So agreeable people might might think better followers. But you know, I don't think it's better to be a leader or a follower. And most of you fall in the middle anyway. And then the patient scale is about anger, the key emotion for dominance, anger. If something makes you angry, it has crossed your boundaries. And the way you resolve that is by asserting your boundaries and kind of reclaiming that space. But if you don't have that anger, you might let people cross your boundaries. You might even not really know where your boundaries are. Agreeableness is classically feminine. What do I mean by classically? I mean, let's go back to the classical ancient Greek myths and see what they said society should be like, okay? So it's classically feminine, strong, yielding, patient, gentle, lenient, forgiving, conflict avoidant, nice and sweet. 
Disagreeableness is classically masculine, agentic, assertive, authoritative, right? Critical, judgmental, logic, setting the boundaries, enforcing them. Oh, you crossed me. I, you know, I remember that. Don't do it again. Okay. Confrontational. Willing to be angry and not be ashamed about it. I went and looked to see if there was a gender difference in uh, agreeableness. And it's not like all the studies have been done and you know that they're probably done on a bias sample, but I didn't find one. And there certainly are women that are just like Judge Judy. That's a disagreeable trait. And there are certainly agreeable. I uh, asked some of my friends to come up with examples and you know, that's what they came up with. Um, Jesse Peterman. I haven't watched these. Conscientiousness. So conscientiousness has four sub-factors. And conscientiousness kind of gets at like work ethic. Um, the organizational, the organization scale is a tendency that's weak order. Like some of you guys are more organized than others. Low scores tend to be sloppy and haphazard. You see the value judgment there? Being fluid isn't necessarily a bad thing, but conscientiousness is highly correlated to job performance because when somebody's giving a job, um, they probably want you to be organized and do things the way they tell them they tell you to do it, right? And uh, cross your T's and, and dot your I's. Um, diligence is your tendency to, to work hard. Achievement orientation, your work ethic. They say low scores have little self-discipline or are not strongly motivated to achieve. Well, maybe they want to do something else, right? Is well-being constant strategy? Perfectionism is a tendency to be thorough and concerned with details. I, I don't like the word, I find perfectionism really stigmatizing. And I'm like, well, what, what is your myth of perfect that you think? It's attention to detail. That's the, the, the less stigmatizing way to put it. Right? Some people have like a lower level of um, and then prudence is your tendency to be deliberately careful and to inhibit your, your impulses. So you can see why employers like people to be conscientious. Uh, the motto of the school is uh, again, quad, agis. You know what that means? It's like a, an exhortation to conscientiousness. I mean, do what you're doing. Hey, if you're going to do something, might as well do it well. Do it rightly, seriously, to the best of like, your ability. That scattering your, your moral forces or your attention. Okay, that's what I gave. I right? just do what you do. Openness to experience has four subfactors. Aesthetic appreciation is like how you're inspired by beauty and art and nature. When I took the test, I was like, I don't really care about art gallery. Didn't have the kind of things that I think are pretty in there. But some people, you know, might be like, wow, look at you. And someone else is like, it's just hell. Um, the inquisitiveness scale is your, so it's like being interested in, in the natural and the human world. It's mm -hmm. like, um, what on the reest that could correlate with uh, the investigative trait. You want to go to the library and learn all these things. Do you want to travel and, and learn about new places? Some people like to innovate and experiment. Creativity is kind of like an artistic, the artistic uh, type on the read set. Low scores have little inclination for original thought. And IO psychology is a discipline of psychology. It's very, very class privileged. And uh, there's a difference between labor and work, where if you're working, means you're creating something new that's socially valued. But if you're not, then you're laboring. And what do laborers do? They shovel the driveway and salt the, clean the bathrooms. And that's not real work. So it's not creating something new. And then some people are, are more into the unusual and, and what's different. And they, they're more eccentric and non conformal And they might have strange or radical ideas. And some folks are more conventional. So 
also steeped, Texaco, just like the big five, is steeped in value judgments. I, I picked this up from their website uh, under honesty and humility. So low honesty and humility is uh, deceitful, sly, greedy, pretentious, hypocritical, boastful, pompous. The hardest one for me to put a positive spin on was, was low honesty and humility. Um, the way I did that was to say, okay, there's things people do that have to do to survive system. And there are also your political skills. Like try to survive in, in a political environment, just like most human environments, being like bluntly honest and refusing to play the game. And like try to exist in a, in a ring game. And a lot of our systems are designed in a way that privilege a few people and they're kind of unfair for everyone else. And that might have something to do with the, the kind of game you end up playing. So I have seen three different versions of the output for the test that I gave. And they all do the same kind of thing. Uh, yes, question. I'm going to throw this at you so that people want <laughs> cool. Um, so there was one more section at the bottom. It was like oh, the um, interstitial scale. With altruism. They don't know it's a thing yet. Okay. So that's altruism. not like yeah. Part so, of the. So none of these things are like set in stone. It's people trying to figure things out. And they're like, oh well, maybe we should pull some things up here, put them over there, and and let's put let, let's give people some questions and see how they respond. So they're still figuring it out. You know, maybe there'll be a seven factor model. Um, all right, so how do we interpret that? Um, you have your output. And what it's doing is showing you uh, a median. If something's normally distributed, the mean and the median fall in the same place. And so that's like the 50th percentile, the middle of the distribution. And so this is someone's agreeableness score. You can say that this is this red line is the 50th percentile, and then this is that person's score, and it's really low. This, this person is kind of stand out for, for disagreeableness. And then here's that person's score of conscientiousness. I don't know how many of you got that box block, but some of you got that box block, and some of you got that idea. And so for this person, um, I'm seeing that, ah, there, I forgot to mention this to you. So this line is the 50th percentile, and then this box, Minus the 20th of the 70th percentile, something like the quality interval range. And so, so you're falling, this person falls below the 20th percentile, below the 50th percentile. And so here, this person, um, is sort of pretty high on conscientiousness, but organized average. Pretty, but recruited into the average. But uh, super, super high attention to detail. And you can see here that the numbers. So it would be your score. Let's say the median score is at the like, red line of the 50th percentile. And then in this case, they're giving you the middle 80%. So they're marking off what's, what's the lowest 10%, where that stands, and where the highest 90% stands. And, and this is more than a certain sample. Is it all of humanity, including people from the Caribbean and people from Russia and people from China? No, it's all normed on mostly white undergraduates at the university of Calgary. And people who use the internet, who have to be wealthy enough to go on a computer, who have time to do tests on the internet. Okay? So remember that one when you're looking at uh, Most Students I talk to, don't be surprised if you see really low scores for honesty and humility. There's a reason for that, because you're young. That's something you kind of develop over time. Think how babies are born, what they do. Okay, they're they're self-focused. It's kind of about their own needs. You're young, you're, you're figuring yourself out. Uh, society is telling you that money and power are important. So, uh, you know, for yourself, for the way that they are. Okay? And then, as you get older, right, you get some hard knocks. You're not going to pedestal. 
uh, expect to see that, that score will hopefully increase over your lifetime or be higher than older students. Um, also, if you come from a privileged background, you expect to see lower amounts of humility because a uh, fact of life is that if you have more, more power, more money, um, you have more time to focus on yourself. So that's how you do it. Any questions about that? No, I'm not going to ask you to show me those. I just want you to kind of reflect on them. So there's lots of limitations to personality models. Um, and so if, if this is ultimately based on words in, in a dictionary, well, what would happen if you used a Chinese dictionary? Right? Like, this is based on the way they describe it, full and H, and Ask who the those tests are normed against. You're we're always assuming that it's everyone in the world, but you know that it's really not. What other aspects of your identity? What might picture the behavior? What about who you are? Not on that test. What about your, your gender identity? What about your sexuality? What about your religiosity? Let's say that you were Muslim. That tells me something, right? What's that? What about your values? Right? What, if, what about does it really answer anything about your, your interests? The, the test uh, reflects being interested in this stuff, being open, being curious, that's kind of artistic and academic interest. What if you have practical interests? You don't have any questions there about. Uh, how much do you like uh, opening the car to keep it around? That's really interesting. We have said that. Does it really tell me about your talents? It doesn't tell me anything about the environment that you're in. Because when you take that test, you're taking it in an environment. But it's not aligned to the environment. It's interesting, I'm like, how would we disentangle? norms, which come from culture, from personality. So the definition of personality in your textbook is that it's your characteristic pattern of thinking, feeling, and acting. And then the definition of norms, which kind of from culture, cultures are better than values. Norms are shared ideas about how people should think, feel, and think. So how much of how you have to act is you and your individual personality, and how much of it is you reflecting the norms of the culture that you're in? It. And I'm going to propose a, a more adaptivistic perspective on personality. So these traits can also be trait skills in certain situations, call for certain skills, and all of those traits have adaptive functions. So agreeable people like a party, they can be peacemakers. Disagreeable people stand up for themselves. They stand up for other people. Right? They all put their foot down. Say, yeah, I'm not going to do that. Sometimes you need somebody to do that. People with high openness are creative and innovative. People with low openness are keepers of tradition, not tradition for bad. So what can you say to them? Right? People with high anxiety see trouble coming from a long way off. Right? And some people that are legitimately part of our society, children, teenagers, the elderly, the vulnerable, can get in a lot of trouble in ways that seem marginal. They might seem very rational to that color. And getting things done in groups requires political skills. So all strengths can also be weaknesses. Let's say that these forces were high in openness. So that's not so great. Well, are you giving enough attention to the practical problems and things in your life? Are you getting a lot of them? Someone else doing that for you? So you can think about personality traits as attractions. You're born with a temperament. And maybe there's an environment out there that suits your temperament and your preferences and your skills where you can apply them to good effect. Personality does change over time. Like over time, people get more introverted and agreeable. Being disagreeable is a lot of fun. It's a lot of fun. 
So if we're assigning it to, I'll ask you to consider, you know, where might you fit in, given that these are allegedly your personality traits? Is there a context for those those work? Maybe I am an extrovert, less training works for me. I don't know why a hundred people watching me doesn't bother me at all. Some people, some of my instructors are really shocked that I record. They feel like that has to be so much easier to have a recording of a lecture out there. Right? That's what some of your instructors say you don't really want to Because that's just overwhelming with them. I don't have a problem with it. So it kind of, it's adapted in this context. But what if I had to uh, get a job uh, in the back room of the library when I was alone? Are they already performing so well then? No, probably not. It's just a little too trouble. And then, if you even look at personality as, as skills, or are there some skills that you want to develop? Maybe I can learn some, some introvert skills. Maybe I can learn to take time to relax. And then to maybe that's something else. Personality is expressed maladaptively in personality disorders. And I don't have enough time to go over this, so I'm kind of going to touch on it. But if you imagine if you had a trait that was like off the charts, and we call that a personality disorder. But remember the personality theory of one thought. So I would sort of say, well, maybe that could be working in a different environment. But personality disorder is, is looking at it. personality is sort of disorder at the individual level. So let's say you're super, super low on honesty and humility, well then I'm uh, driving into the place of what we call narcissistic personality disorder. And in social personalities where uh, people feel more loose to grammar, social grammar is a nice stalker, classic example of uh, antisocial personality disorder. So somebody with antisocial personality disorder thinks that it's okay for them to violate their rights. So, he thought it would be an interesting kind of experience of power to kill somebody. That would violate like somebody else's rights. That's what an antisocial personality disorder is about. Some people are so, so, so inverted that they just don't want to be there at all. Get off the planet on the They can have fascinating rich inner worlds, do some really interesting creative works. That kind of definitely don't want to friend ever type is. It's, uh, it's Some people have a, these really, they're really self-referencing, they really see a lot of connections between between things, and they have their own personal interpretation of that, it's kind of bizarre to other people. They see, see plots everywhere. Maybe the guy who's doing this, maybe they're doing that. So that's a distrustful self-referencing characteristic of disagreeableness. Push or extreme level. Some people seem to like to be the center of attention. They they engage in a lot of narrative and storytelling. They tell these grand stories. Kind of. Um, they might feel numb when when they're not doing that. Call that histrionic personality disorder. And all of you, we're just to be honest, it's very sexist, by the way. And back to that, I've talked about it all this. But it's just to be honest, it's not narcissistic. It's not about what you buy. It's like about having the attention on you. That's too much. Then there's a borderline personality disorder. And that one really throws me. Because I can't understand it. According to what I know about personality theory. I have studied the best personality theory that we have, and just it doesn't seem to, to work out. It's like one of these dimensions taken to an extreme, or used in the wrong context. This, would, this is the clean screening instrument of the BPD. Just take it out on to the evidence. Now, this is the Relationship, 
refer to themselves physically. You can say you call it impulsive, going on a eating binge, having a hurt or a hurt. Seeming like you're in really bad moods sometimes. Could be angry. And they even act in a way they seem angry. Mm -hmm. They might be distrustful of other people. They might feel like they're living in a cafe at Atlantic. How long is this real? Yeah. Uh, what do you mean by extremely moody? Well, it looks like they're in a really bad mood sometimes. A lot of this looks like how humans behave when they're under tremendous social stress. You are under tremendous stress. Times in your life is when it seems like the country is wrong against you. I think if you're on the wrong end of system, that is really overwhelming. Well, I don't know. You might just want to scream and let go sometimes. You might drink, try to get away from it. You might get into some arguments. You might be angry. You might even express your anger. Oh my. You might be distrustful. Any of the people who are supposed to protect you are really not. You can feel half dead. You don't belong in a social system. An identity is a social construct. We're just for social dialogue. Your identity now works for you. Humans like to be supported by other humans. So be aware of this screening tool if you're ever in an abusive relationship with a system. Okay? It can be extremely stressful. So, and there's, there's different reasons why I think people could end up with a lot of stress. Sometimes children are raised in abusive environments. A lot of people with um, BPD have history of child abuse. Okay? There's no parenting license. And then maybe they don't have the skills to navigate relationships as an adult. Maybe there's nothing wrong with the other people or the system. And but they have been adapted to abusive relationships. That could be, I'm speculating. Maybe that's one thing that could be going on. Sometimes normal people are in abusive relationships. And the scariest ones are when the abusive relationship is with a stiff Okay. And sometimes you might, some of you might experience that if, if you deal with workplace social bullying or mobbing, constructive dismissal, like when you piss off management or like bye bye, granted, sure, you're gone. That's a very ugly social process. It can be very overwhelming for people. Okay. So if you are in an abusive relationship or with, I think it's more so with, with like a, a system, we see this with like women who are in messy violence as systems. You'll answer yes to a lot of those questions. You will be angry. You will distrust people. You will snap. One night you might drink too much. Okay. And so, um, a bit of a BPD skeptic, is what I will say. Because I don't understand how it works, how this flows out from personality theory. 
All right. Well, it's important to talk about the, the situation, and this is kind of a the, the blind spot in, in personality therapy. So your behavior isn't just about what you want, your temperament, or what you like. It's also about what's going on in your environment. However, personality traits like this, personality, uh, personality measures are predictive, like they have utility, they're predictors of mortality, of occupational attainment. Yeah, higher the person with a higher conscientiousness score, they'll probably do better. Okay. But they don't, they're not that strong of a predictor. So if let's say the test says you're an extrovert, does that mean that if when I see you at the party tomorrow, you're going to be uh, the social butterfly? Well, maybe not. Right? Maybe you had a bad day. Maybe you have a test to, to study for. And, and so it kind of predicts your average behavior in the long run over many social situations. I should see being more precarious. Remember that the immediate situation can powerfully influence somebody's behavior. Right? If I tell you to do something and you'll get it and you don't, you'll probably do it, right? Whether you want to or not. Assuming that that's motivated. So personality traits do influence their behavior. And then social, the social environment shapes us through processes of like conditioning and observational learning, right? You, if you some, see somebody getting hurt doing something, maybe you won't do it. Uh, there are high status people that act in certain ways, so you try to imitate them. You're rewarded and punished for acting this way and in that way. And then your cognitive processes matter too. They're also part of that. So how you react isn't just about how the environment or just about your trace. There's your thinking and being, and it's also about how you perceive your environment and, and think about social situations or think about situations. So let's say somebody's presented with a decision to go bungee jumping. Well, what are they going to do? Well, maybe their extroversion predicts some of that, but you know, they have history. What if they've been injured in action before? And then maybe they'll say no. External factors. You know, are, are their friends putting pressure on them to do it? And these are all linked because personality traits determine who your friends are. If you're an extrovert, maybe you hang out with other extroverts. Okay. And so this is the, the heart of the idea of reciprocal determinant is that there's an interaction and mutual influence of behavior, your internal personal factor, and the environment. Okay, that's a sort of a social cognitive perception of the self. Our predictions are often wrong. You see all these shows that are like, let's come to these situations, see how people act, and see who's like the top level, and then they're always wrong. That person is never a top model. Okay. If we were to look at, if you wanted one best predictor for somebody's behavior, if somebody's past behavior is in a similar situation, it's not perfect. People can and do change, but that's the strongest overall predictor. Okay. The best predictor of a student's grade in this class is your past grades in a similar class. And that is why it probably won't work for me to try and Okay. And so maybe the best way to predict someone's job performance isn't with that personality test for conscientiousness. It might be in Putting them in a realistic situation, that's likely to do in that job. It's called a realistic job. Go oh, rest the cash. See how you do it. All right. Um, any questions or comments? No? Okay. Next unit on developmental psychology. Put three, two on Sunday, five stroke midnight, no three. And I'm going to stop the recording. Thank you.